All right, so yesterday I, had, uh, I didn't want to do this during class because I, I felt that it would cut too much into your practice time. But we had solved a logarithmic equation that had no solutions, and somebody was wondering what the graphs would look like if you had no solutions. Because, you know, in a very general sense, whether it's logarithmic or trigonometric or exponential or polynomial or quadratic, I guess quadratic is a polynomial, You can always solve an equation graphically by graphing y1 equals one side and y2 equals the other side. Can I get everybody to get settled in, please? Thank you. Uh, you can always solve any equation by graphing y1 equals one side, y2 equals the other side, and finding out where they intersect. So when we had that question yesterday and we checked both of our solutions, I don't remember which question it was, and it doesn't matter. I'll make up a new one. Um, what I said was if you did graph them, the graphs wouldn't intersect. And I want to use this opportunity to show you how to graph logarithmic functions on your calculator, because we really haven't done that. And I want to point out to you a big flaw, graphically speaking, in terms of your graphing calculator. And by graphically, I mean visually. The graphics are not good. So let's say that you had the following equation. 1 plus log base 2 of 8x plus 4. And you also had equals, and this was equal to log base 2 of x minus four minus two. And you wanted to solve that logarithmic equation graphically. And it turns out I've set this up, I believe, so that there are going to be no solutions. First of all, you should be able to, and we'll get into this in more detail today, but you should be able to tell me what this looks like, starting with log base two of x and transforming it. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm simply talking about putting this into your calculator. So if you have a TI-84, then when you graph this, we can simply enter 1 plus, and then we can go to our math menu and choose log base and put in a base 2, and then put in the 8x plus 4, and then get out of that argument. I think that's how it works, yep. And that's it. And I, right now, I'm actually going to graph this without worrying about the other side of the equation just yet. I'm going to go zoom 6 just to see what it looks like. And I get this thing, which, and I've chosen these numbers carefully because it looks as though that graph starts on the x-axis, doesn't it? It almost looks like a square root function. But yet, if we use our knowledge of logarithmic functions and graphs... We know that this as a graph will be the graph of y equals log base 2 of x which has a vertical asymptote here. This is log base 2 of x and it goes down to infinity. We know that this is going to be stretched somehow which I really don't care about. It's going to be stretched horizontally it's going to be shifted one up because of that one. But more importantly, it's going to be shifted half a unit to the left, which means that the asymptote, I know there's a stretch going on, and I know there's a shift up and down, but I don't care. The asymptote is that x equals negative one-half, and this thing goes down forever. Your graphing calculator can't cope with trying to graph a part of a function that's too steep. It doesn't know what to do. So in fact, if I go back to my graphing calculator and I turn the axes off so you can see the function without the axes interfering, I can do that by going Format and go Axes Off, and I graph it. It, it looks like this logarithmic function just kind of starts in the middle of nowhere and goes up. 
but they don't do that. They go down forever. So I'm cautioning you that when you graph logarithmic functions, they don't look proper on your graphing calculator. Do you get my drift here? That's an interesting question. Are you saying, so if I had, I don't know. I, I think maybe. You're saying maybe if I had negative 3, and we'll graph it, will the calculator be able to find out where they intersect? Is that what you're asking? I would assume so. See, before I find out the answer to that, and it's a great question, the reason why the calculator doesn't draw it, and I've talked about this before, I believe is because the calculator plots points by generating tables of values. So it calculates a y coordinate at x, and it, it calculates a y coordinate at a particular x point, and it plots it. It plots the result here. And then it moves a little bit to the left and calculates the result. But because the asymptote is because there's an asymptote and the graph is getting closer and closer to it, if you go just a little bit to the left, even though you're not at the asymptote yet, that next point may be down here. I think in this case what's happening is it goes to the next point to the left and it can't calculate it because it's on the asymptote, so then it goes to the right. It's not even finding this point down here. So, But now let's answer the question, because I don't know. I'm assuming... Boy, I don't know. Part of me wants to say yes, part of me wants to say no. That's not an axis, right? That's a line, y equals negative 3. So I'm going to calculate intersect. First curve, second curve, guess. It can. So the function exists there, right? Uh, anyway, be very careful interpreting graphs because sometimes you'll be given a multiple choice question that says, which of the following graphs is the graph of this particular function? And the wise people at Alberta Learning have recognized this flaw in the calculator, so they will put this graph as one of the choices. Because if you look at your calculator, that's right. But in fact, the correct graph is not this, it's this. Okay, getting back to my uh, imaginary question here. I want to solve this equation. I'm going to get rid of all of this. I want to solve this equation. So now I'm also going to graph. And I'm going to turn my axes back on. I'm going to get rid of the y equals negative 3 and graph log base two, and by the way, this is an equation you could solve algebraically. Log base two of x minus four, get out of there, minus two, graph. So here comes the first one. There's the second one. They just will not intersect. So I don't know exactly what it was yesterday, but that's the kind of situation you would get. Finally, if you want to graph, and I won't go through the whole problem again, but if you want to graph the left side of this equation with a TI calculator, then you have to use the change of base formula. This log base 2 of 8x plus 4 is log base 10 of 8x plus 4 over log base 10 of 2. So that's what you would have to enter on a TI-83. Change of base formula says you can take any new base, and I'm using base 10 because I have that key, any new base logarithm of the old argument over the new base logarithm of the old base. That's the change of base formula. So if I were to, I regret closing that other calculator because I could have shown you they were identical. Uh, 1 plus Log base 2 of 8x plus 4 is log of 8x plus 4 divided by... It's another thing I like about this calculator. I don't have to scroll out of the arguments. I just close the brackets. 
uh, over log base 10 of 2, zoom 6. Now that may not look identical to what we had before, but I think I had a different window setting. Maybe. It doesn't matter though. Okay. So now getting to your assignment, your practice. There's really uh, only a couple of main ideas here. If you can get log base B of an item equal to log base B of an apparently different item, then these two items have to be equal. That's one strategy you can use to solve a logarithmic equation. The other strategy, of course, is if you have log base B of some item equals some other item, then you can write that as the base raised to what the logarithm is equal to is equal to the argument of the logarithm. In other words, you can convert it to exponential form. In all cases, remember what you're trying to do in all cases, remember what you're, you need to remember to do is when you are done and you get your solutions for the variable, you have to check them to make sure that they're not extraneous. And that simply involves checking to make sure that the arguments you get by putting in your solution, all of the arguments are positive. If any of the arguments are not positive, so if any of them are zero or if any of them are negative, you take that solution and you throw it out. It's extraneous. So does anybody have any questions you would like me to go over from any of these? Marcel? 3E on 34. So we have, first of all, I want you to note that these are all base 2 logarithms. And you can only use laws of logarithms to pack separate logarithms into a single logarithm, which is what we're going to do, if the bases are the same. So because this is a sum of two logarithms. I can write it as the base two logarithm of the product of 3a and 2. Because this is a difference of two logarithms, I can write this as a base two logarithm of 8 over 4. So just simplifying ever so slightly, I get log base 2 of 6a equals log base 2 of 2. And since they're both base 2 logarithms and they're equal to each other, the arguments must be equal. So 6a is equal to 2. And when you divide both sides by 6, you get a third. Uh, you know, I've already just checked in my head. I, I knew there was 3a for an argument up there. So if I put 1 third in, I get a positive number. We're good. Is that okay? Any other questions? Go ahead, Dua. Um, question number four is 5H. 4H. Because H, let me rewrite it. Well, I'm going to actually back up here and talk about Marcel's question first. In Marcel's question, we had logarithms everywhere, which means we employed this strategy that you're looking at on the right side of the screen. In your question, 4H, everybody, when you look at 4H, there's that number of, I think it's 2 in the equation, that is not a logarithm. I'm talking here about this number right here. So there's part of the equation that's not a logarithm. And if there's part of the equation that's not a logarithm, then what you're going to be doing is focusing on the strategy that's to the left of the screen in red. So what we want to do here, Dua, is move all of the logarithms to one side and leave the number alone. So we'll have log base 2 of x minus log base 2. Well, I, I hope... that you're okay with that move, right? And in keeping with, you know, being technically precise, it's the logarithm of the whole thing. It's not the log of x minus 3, then raised to the half, right? And this is equal to 2. So now we can pack those two logarithms together, 
and write it as log base 2 of x of x over root x minus 3 equals 2. This is a comment to everybody, but you Math 31 students might find it particularly of interest. You know, sometimes we prefer to use exponents for square roots. It makes things easier. Uh, for example, when we differentiate in calculus. Or, for example, in order to, you know, if I had one half up here on the exponent, or I had a square root, rather, on the exponent, I think of it as a half so I can move it down, right? I'm moving towards a square root here because now my next move is to take this base and raise it to this and set it equal to the argument. And what I notice here do a, is I have an equation to solve that contains a square root. And to get rid of a square root, I'm going to at some point square both sides. And I could square everything right now, but I'm going to clean this up a little bit and then square it. So I'm going to write 4 equals x over root x minus 3. And now I'm going to square both sides. You could feel free to do kind of a cross multiplication and then square it, but it doesn't really matter. So my next move is to eliminate that pesky square root. And in order to do that, I can square both sides because squaring and square rooting are opposite operations. They're inverse operations. So I get 16 equals x squared over x minus 3. When I square the x, it becomes x squared. When I square the square root, the square root just goes away. I can now multiply both sides by x minus 3, and we've had this discussion numerous times. Look at where I wrote the 16. I didn't even consciously do that, but it's written as a numerator. And I know that you can cross multiply, but I would prefer for you to think, how can I get rid of that denominator? I mean, that's your motivation. How do you get rid of the square root? Square both sides. How do you get rid of a denominator? Multiply both sides by x minus 3. And what we get is x minus 3 times 16 equals x squared because these cancel. Now we're, we're getting into more familiar territory. It's a quadratic equation because of that x squared. So we get x squared equals 16x. It's been a long week. I'm pretty sure that's 48, but maybe somebody could just double check. It is good. So I zero the equation. I get x squared minus 16x plus 48 equals 0. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give positive 48 and add to give negative 16. Uh, again, everybody, well, these are both negative. That's not my point, though. Those have to be negative because they're multiplying to give a positive. I don't, I don't believe you would ever see on a Math 30-1 exam a logarithmic equation that turned into a quadratic equation that required you use the quadratic formula. Okay. Um, if it ever did, I would suggest that it would probably be just a multiple choice or numerical response question, and you could solve it graphically anyway. I don't think we would ever do that on a written response. Anyway, the numbers are 4 and 12, negative 4 and negative 12 which means that when you set each of those factors equal to 0, you get x equals 4, you get x equals 12. All that remains to be explored is to go back to the original equation, which is h. And, and you know, even technically, even this, don't look at that equation. Look at the original equation before you did anything. I know it's, in this case, not going to matter, but... Um, what was one of the numbers? One of the numbers was 4. If I put 4 here and 4 here, are both arguments greater than 0? Yes. So 4 is in. 12 is in as well for the same reason. So you have two solutions. Other questions? Shesmaida. 20A in the textbook. 
So we have x to the 2 over log x equals x. And, and I described these questions in 20 as being um, unique, I believe. It's not that they're necessarily difficult. They're just weird. And I could really see this being on a diploma exam. We have x to the 2 over log x equals x. Now, this is a logarithmic equation, but it's also an exponential equation because there's an x in the exponent. By comparison, which is how we initially solved exponential equations, by comparison, we said that if the bases are identical, the exponents must be equal. So if I have x raised to the 2 over log x equals x to the 1, since the base is x for both, then these two exponents have to be the same. So now all of a sudden I've changed this to a much simpler problem. If 2 over log x equals 1, what's x? Well, let's, I know you could cross multiply, okay? But I'm thinking in a, a more general sense that what you want to do is multiply both sides of this equation by log of x. Because, and again, I'm perfectly aware you understand, hopefully, that that's the result of cross multiplication. But if there were three terms, this, wouldn't, this would have to be done, and cross multiplication would not work. So what happens here, says Maida, is these two cancel. We're left with 2 on the left equals log of x. Log of x is log base 10 of x. And what that means is when we write this in exponential form, we're going to write 10 raised to the 2 equals x. So x is 100. And you might want to, at this point, you know, uh, go up and make sure that when you put 100 in for x, that it's a positive log argument. But of course it is. Right. Is that okay? okay? Other questions? Go ahead. This one? Okay. So you're asked to determine the value of n, which seems rather strange because you have an equation that contains x and n, right? So the question is, how can we do this? Well, what we can do is start setting this up the way we would solve any logarithmic equation, which is to write either a single log equals a single log, or to write a single log equals a non-log. And if we can get a single log equals a single log, then these two things must be equal. Right? I had mentioned that earlier today, but I'm just repeating myself. Or if we can get, and I'll just use a different color, if we can get a single log equals a non-log, then we can write the base raised to what the logarithm is equal to is equal to the argument. So there's two main strategies. I mean, I understand it's not always going to be one of these two. It could be kind of a weird one like the one Shez might have asked about. So in this case... Since all of these terms, Ian, contain logarithms, since all of these terms contain logarithms, and I'm just doing a little bit of manipulation here with brackets and I'm moving that exponent up. So are you focusing on this, please? Thank you. Um, our first strategy is going to be the one we use. We pack everything together. Now, I can move this exponent, of, or this coefficient, rather, up top as an exponent. So I'm going to end up, for the first logarithm, the log of, and this is the downside of having to put those brackets if you want to be 
precise in your meaning. I don't think you need all those brackets. I really don't. But I'm really highlighting that that's what's going on now. Plus log of x cubed equals log of x to the n. Okay, so before we pack these together, we need to bring the two logarithms. Before we compare logarithms, we need to pack together the logarithms on the left. So when you add logarithms, you multiply the arguments. So I'm going to have x to the sixth because a power of a power means you multiply the exponents times x to the 3. This will equal log of x to the n. Somewhere along the way, I, I either dropped the base or it was base 10. I, I wasn't even paying attention, actually. It was base 10. Bottom line is these two logs are both base 10 logs, which means the arguments must be equal. But <laughs> when you multiply a common base, you add the exponents. And now we have same bases on the exponential form of this. It's actually a polynomial form because x is in the base, but that doesn't really matter. Since it's x raised to the 3 plus 1 sixth, and it's equal to x to the n, n must be equal to 3 plus 1 sixth. And that will be the answer. So 3.16 repeating. I, I don't know. I think 1 over 6 is 0.16666. Okay. Other questions? JV, or Adrian, sorry. 5F? Okay. This guy right here? Okay. All right, so what do we got? 2 times log base 3 of n cubed minus log base 3 of n squared equals 0. So this is an interesting one. We cannot, Edrian, move any exponents down because the exponents that get moved down are always the exponents that are contained inside of the argument. And we're not squaring here. We're not squaring n. We're squaring the whole logarithm. So that squared, you can't do anything with. We're not cubing n. We're cubing the whole logarithm. But what we can compare this true to is if I had something like 2a cubed minus a squared equals 0, you could factor a squared out. And if I factor a squared out of this, I'm left with 2a minus 1 equals 0. What does that mean? And we'll get back to the logarithmic equation in a second. But if it was... 2a cubed minus a squared, and I take a squared out. You're okay with this step, Adrian? Okay. Um, that means that a squared can equal 0 because it's being multiplied to get 0, or 2a minus 1 can equal 0. And in the first case, a would be 0, and in the second, a would be a half. So how is that helpful? Well, I'm not so sure we need to... Um, do that. I, that's just me in kind of a teaching mode. The idea here is we can take out a log base 3 of n quantity squared and be left with 2 times log base 3 of n minus 1. That means that this factor, log base 3 of n, quantity squared equals 0. And this factor, 2, log base 3 of n, 
minus 1 equals 0. If I take the square root of both sides to get rid of the squared, I, I technically go plus or minus the square root of 0, but the square root of 0 is 0. It's not positive or negative. So I end up with log base 3 of n is equal to 0. And when you write this in exponential form, we can write 3 to the 0 is equal to n, which means n is equal to 1, because 3 to the 0 is 1. Over here, when I add 1 to both sides and divide both sides by 2, I get log base 3 of n. Well, maybe I'll do it this way in steps, just because that log might be visually confusing. Okay. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you see that if you rearrange this, you get the logarithm equals 1 over 2? Okay. Well, I'm going to do it in steps. Uh, then we divide both sides by 2, and that means that 3 to the half is equal to n. So n equals root 3 and n equals 1. And I don't really believe that this question is outside of the bounds of good taste for an exam at this level. I, I think this is a legitimate question. That being said, I think the likelihood of you seeing something like this, where it's degree 3, it's pretty small. Is that helpful, Adrian? Okay. Yeah, of course. Other questions? Go ahead, Arden. 5G. 5G on the same set? Okay, so 5 to the log base 3 of x minus log base 3 of 2 equals 125. So I guess what's important here is you, un you understand that, uh, we've already seen an example like this. There was a logarithmic equation, I think uh, Shazmida had asked about it, number 20A in the textbook. There was a logarithmic equation which turned out to be not only logarithmic but exponential. So even though we're solving equations that have logarithms in them, we might still have to rely on our work with exponential equations. And one of the things you notice here is that 125 can be written as base 5. In fact, if you, if, you solve, if you look at this equation in the most general sense, forget about what the exponent on 5 is. Just forget about that. The unknown is in the exponent. So I want you to follow this carefully. This is an exponential equation. There are two ways to solve these. One is to write the equation using a common base. And you can do that here. So we can write this as 5 raised to the log base 3 of x minus log base 3 of 2 equals 5 to the 3. I said there are two ways to solve it. One, if you can write it as a common base, do so. The second way is to take the log of both sides. Listen very carefully, very carefully. Never take the log of both sides if you can solve it with a common base. Because the ones that I would give you on an exam that could be solved with a common base become nightmarish if you take the log of both sides to bring the exponents down. Okay. So now what we have is 5 to 1 exponent equals 5 to an apparently different exponent. That means that these two exponents, log base 3 of x minus log base 3 of 2, these two exponents, that one and this one, are equal. And what we've turned this into now, Arden, is a purely a logarithmic equation, where, and I, we've done this again and again and again, I don't know where it is, but I can find one, where in this particular case, we have, if you look at what you, you have in your equation so far, you have logs on one side and numbers on the other. So we're going to be working towards a single logarithm equals a non-logarithm. I think that's it. I can pack these two logarithms on the left together and write log base 3 
that's an L of x over 2 equals 3. You know, even with, even with this 3 written here, I, I see too often people just write x over 2 equals 3. They forget that they have to take this 3 that I've underlined and raise it to this 3 to get the argument. So you're pretty much done. 3 cubed is 27. Multiply both sides by 2, and you'll get x equals 54. Is that OK? Jonathan, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. 4D. 4D? Again, what we have here in 4D, everyone, is a logarithmic equation that has logarithms and non-logarithms. So your goal here is to get a single logarithm equals a single non-logarithm. And I can put these two logarithms together right out of the gate and write log, this is a base 3 logarithm, of 3x minus 1 over x minus 1. And this is equal to 4. Does that make sense so far, Jonathan? Okay. So now that we have it in that form, we write it in exponential form. I can take the base of the logarithm raised to what the logarithm is equal to. That will give us the argument. And you know, this is, this is called a rational equation because there's a rational function included in it. But the bottom line here is we can multiply both sides by x minus 1 to eliminate that x minus 1 in the denominator and get three to the four is 81. 84 or 81 times x minus 1 equals what happens over here is these cancel. And uh, I just want to double check something here. Yeah, it's fine. This isn't even quadratic. Right? It's, it, there's no x squared, so we're just going to expand it and see what happens. 81x minus 81 equals 3x minus 1. I guess I can subtract 3x from both sides and get 78x equals negative 1 plus 81 is 80. So x equals 80 over 78. I don't know what that is. A little bit more than one. Is that does that jibe with the answer? Uh, be like one point. Four, yeah, and that eighty over seventy nine, re seventy eight reduces to forty over thirty nine. Other questions? Go ahead, Adrian. Okay. A question that I believe is, I mean, it's not a certainty on an exam. I don't believe that you'd be surprised to see it on an exam. If I were to tag a probability for a diploma exam, I'd say it's a 50-50 shot that you could see this. And the reason is, it's not that difficult of a question once you apply the math 30 to it. Well. Once you apply the math 30 to it, it becomes not a math 30 question. So Alberta Ed's position is if you've learned it before, then it should be easy. We have log base 3 of 243. The brackets here are absolutely not necessary. Equals 2x plus y. We also have log base 2 of 64 equals x minus y. So this is, uh, I guess at its heart, a system of equations, isn't it? Two equations with two unknowns. But what is log base 3 of 243? And I, I want you to figure this out without using the change of base formula. Log base 3 of 243 
is the number to which you raise three to get 243. So let's plunk around a bit on our calculator and see if we can determine what exponent we apply to three to get a total power of 243. Yes, five. So this becomes five equals 2x plus y. And I'm going to stack the next equation under it. And I'm not sure why I wrote 26 there. I have no clue. This is log base 2 of 64. To what exponent do we raise 2 to get 64? Uh, I want to say 6. So, and by the way, if you have to use the change of base formula to find out log base 2 of 64 is 6, and to find out log base 3 of 243 is 5, if you have to use the change of base formula or your log base function if you have a TI-84, feel free. But, I, but I'm really warning you, if you get lazy like that, you get rusty in the head, math-wise. Uh, now it's a system of equations really from grade 10 math. And I would add these two equations together. When I add the two equations together, I get 11 equals 3x. The y's cancel, which means x equals 11 over 3. I just want to confirm something because it's kind of peculiar to get fractional answers in a system of equations in high school math. Is that the answer? OK, so I just wanted to make sure that I didn't make a mistake. Now, in order for you to find out why, you can use any of these two equations you like. I would probably use this. 6 equals 11 thirds minus y. So I move the y over to the other side and subtract the 6. And I want to say negative 7 thirds is what you're going to get. Is that OK, Adrian? OK. Any other questions before we get into a bit of review today? Twenty B. Okay. Boy, that's a weird one. Log of X raised to the log of X. So what I would say to you is we're we're back at what Arden and I have discussed numerous times. At first, when I looked at this, I assumed that this meant that. That's what I saw in my head. That's how I interpreted it. And then I started running through what we would have to do, and I realized it's going to be a nightmare. So I think the intention here is that this means log of x to the log x. And, and I'm going to go back to the one you asked about yesterday, Arden. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was, it was something like, it was a logarithm of, I don't know, 8x minus 3 to the 5. I, I don't know exactly what it was, and it doesn't matter. And there was a base there as well, but I don't care. The question revolved around, where is that 5? And, and I said, well, it's here. And I really wish that I really wish that everybody would put that extra set of brackets around an entire argument. And, and the reason is this, that when you look at your formula sheet, I, I, I believe this is really important, what we're talking about here. When you look at your formula sheet, see that, that power law, log base b of m to the n, which is in the center of your screen right now, 
has brackets around that m to the n. And it's trying to stress to you that you are only allowed to move an exponent down in front if that exponent is on the base inside of the argument. However, and I've, I've talked about this numerous times, but I'm going to attack it from a different angle this time. However, it's pretty much become standard practice for everybody to go, ah, eh, you know what, we don't need to write that every time. So I guess let me summarize this by saying, if you don't see a set of brackets there, you're going to assume that that exponent is on the argument. And you're going to assume that it's that. If that exponent is being applied to the whole logarithm, it will be made clear as it is in C. So C is a perfect example here. When you take a look at the left side, that too is clearly being applied to the entire logarithm, which means you cannot move it down. When you take a look at the right side, that x squared is not in brackets. I don't see any brackets, so then what I assume is that it means this. So b means this. And that means that we can move that exponent of log x, the exponent on the x, out in front and have log x times log x. So this is going in front to produce that log x. And then I have log of the old base, which is x. And this is equal to, what was it? 4. So now I have log of x quantity squared equals 4. And again, I, I really wish somebody would adopt this notation for that. It would just clear up so much confusion. I take the square root of both sides to get rid of that squared. And if I do this, I've made a fatal mistake because I have to say plus or minus, plus or minus the square root of 4. And that means that log of x equals 2, or log of x equals negative 2. Be careful here. A logarithm can be negative. The argument can't be negative. Right? So now I say, well, this is base 10, so 10 to the 2 equals x. This is base 10, so 10 to the negative 2 equals x. So x equals 100, and x equals 1 over 100. Is that OK? OK. Ian? Are you okay with this line? Yes, but I don't know how you've got that. So you're not okay with this line then? No. Okay. If I have log of x to the a, that is a log of x, yes? If I have log of x to the puppy, that is puppy log of x, yes? Well, I have log of x to the log x. So when you move this a in front, Ian, when you move this a in front, you get that. No, just it's, you're way ahead of me now. You're asking about how I get this, right? Okay, so just, just stop for a second, please. We move this A in front, this is what we get. But nothing to do with common bases. There's only one logarithm here. I'm moving the A in front. When I move this puppy in front, it becomes this. When I move this exponent in front, it becomes this. That's all that's happening. I'm taking the exponent and I'm moving it in front. And, and even 
here it isn't so much to go from this line where the red arrow is or the brown arrow is to the next line. That it really, it's not so much that they have common bases, they're identical. If I have r times r, I can write r squared. If I have uh, glasses times glasses, I can write glasses squared. So since I have log of x times log of x, I can write log of x squared. Does that do it for you? Okay, perfect. All right, we are going to move on now. I want you to please just uh, get out. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to race through this because I, I want to give you some time here to practice today. Uh, get out the handout that I gave you a little bit earlier today on the review. I'm going to, in a little bit, in hopefully less than 10 minutes, if I can get through this in that time, give you a handout with lots of multiple choice numerical response questions that are broken down by topics this time. And one of the topics is transformations of exponential functions and transformations of logarithmic functions. Within that topic, you're expected to know that if you have an exponential function where y equals the base to the x, if the base is bigger than 1, it's increasing. What I would say to you is, being able to take this graph and apply all of our transformations to it is no different than being able to take any graph and apply transformations to it. Except that there's terminology here, right? There's a horizontal asymptote. So the transformations are going to lead you to a new horizontal asymptote. Uh, if you know the domain and range of this first function, then the transformation template will lead you to a new domain and range. So this thing that I have the green arrow pointing to is nothing new. What's new is what's circled in that green cloud. If you have a base between 0 and 1, then it's a decreasing exponential function. And again, we expect you in this unit to be able to tell us about transformations and how they affect that function. This is going to form a big part of the exam. Uh, you already did a written response assignment on this. By big part, I mean it will be in at least two or three questions somewhere that you can solve compound interest problems, population growth, population decline problems, exponential growth and decay in general, including half-life. So make sure that you understand that formula, which is on your formula sheet, and what all of the parameters are. A is the initial amount of the thing that's growing or decaying. B is the base, which is the, I call it the factor by which things change. So, you know, in one of your questions, maybe you were told the population of a town is growing by 4%. That would be 1.04. Maybe in another town it was declining by 2%. That would be 0.98. Um, for B. P is how long it takes to happen. And I believe in the assignment you did, P was a year. Am I right? Because those were annual changes. But if I deal with compound interest, let's say... I have something, this isn't interest, I guess, but something is declining by 12% every six months. Well, if it's declining by 12%, you take 100% minus 12% is 88%. That's why the base is this. But if it does it every six months, then you have to use six months for P or 0.5 for P if you want to work in years. And there's another example you can read there. The meaning of a logarithm. So... It is important. I mean, this is where we're at. When you look at the bottom of the screen here, this is where most of you are. You, you don't even need to be told this. If I have x equals 3 to the y, I can rearrange it and write it as y equals log base 3 of x. Right? You can translate exponential to logarithmic. But it is just as important that you understand that y equals 3 to the x and x equals 3 to the y, which is y equals log base 3 of x, that these two things, 
the thing I'm going to highlight in yellow and the thing I'm going to highlight in blue, which can be written in two ways, that those two things are inverses of each other. The exponential function y equals 3 to the x is shown in blue, and the corresponding inverse, which is the logarithmic function, is shown in red. You don't have some kind of weird, funky box around that x, do you? You do in your handout. I don't know what happened there. It should just be y equals x. This is the most popular logarithmic function. I'll explain wh what's popular about it in a second. But when you have a base bigger than 1 for a logarithmic function, this is what it looks like. That's why this red function is log base 3 of x. It goes through an x-intercept of 1. The vertical axis is an asymptote. Um, you are definitely expected to be able to apply transformations to that function. Okay. So that's the starting function. You have to know what the stretches and reflections and translations do to it in terms of domain, range, intercepts, all that. If the base of a logarithmic function is between 0 and 1, it looks like that. And I want to be very clear here. You're expected to know that that's what it looks like. But you are not expected to be able to apply transformations to it. So on your handout, you can cross off this stuff. You don't need to worry about that. I'm going to race through the rest of this, even though the amount of the types of questions that we can have with this is voluminous. There's tons of stuff. But look, all this is saying is you better be able to work with your laws of logarithms. I have four things up there. I have, I'll just separate these so you understand. There, there's two there. You have what's called the product law, which says the law of a product is the sum of the logs. The quotient law, which says the quo a log of a quotient is the difference of logs. Make sure you know that it's the log of the numerator minus the log of the denominator. The power law, no pun intended, incredibly powerful in its applications. You can use it to solve equations. You can use it to solve weird kind of questions. You use it to rewrite expressions. And then we have the change of base formula in the bottom right, which is just, you know, it's, it's a useful thing to know. You, you don't have to use it. You can get by in this whole course without using the change of base formula. But it comes in very handy. So make sure you know how to use those rules. This is what we've been working on the past three days, basically, four days even. We, we use them to solve exponential equations, which leads me to pretty much the last page here. When you solve exponential equations, and <coughs> there's two things you can do here. And what I often see on a written response related to logs and exponents is a written response where you have an exponential equation to solve and a second exponential equation to solve. You have two, two equations. One of them you can solve with a common base. One of them you can't. And the reason why we like to give you those two is because the one that you can't, you have to use logarithms. You have to take the log of both sides to proceed. So that kind of written response kind of strikes exponential rules and logarithmic rules off the list in terms of us as teachers trying to figure out what you know. And remember, if you can solve an exponential equation, and Marcel, I think you might have been out of the room when I said this. When you, if you can solve an exponential equation by using a common base, do it. You could also solve it by taking the log of both sides, but that is a time killer. It's going to really eat up a lot of exam time. Uh, and logarithmic equations, uh, again, there's two main ideas here. If you can get a log equals a log, drop the logs and put the arguments equal to each other. If you can only get a log equals a non-log, rewrite it in exponential form. 
and always check for extraneous solutions, always. An extraneous solution in the context of a logarithmic equation means that when you put your solution in for the unknown, I'm just going to assume it's x, the argument becomes negative or zero. Your argument has to be positive in order for your solution. Oh, you got it yesterday, right? Your argument has to be greater than zero, not zero, not negative. Your argument has to be greater than zero in order for your solution to stand. Yeah. So what you're working on for the rest of today and hopefully for some time on the weekend is actually putting all of this into practice for your exam Tuesday. Try to get, you know, a fair amount of this done for Monday so that we can have some meaningful questions being completed on the board. Thank you. And you got about uh, 15, 20 minutes here to work on this stuff today, about 15 minutes. Uh, I will try to get your, well, your assignments will be back to you mon by Monday. Any questions? You look like you want to ask me something, no? Okay. All right, so I will get your assignments marked uh, this weekend or later today, but you won't get them back until Monday. I th think I need yours. Yeah. All right, get to work. I want to take attendance and do a couple things, and then I'll be around to help you out. Uh, you'll notice right now here, I said not 21, right? Remember this? In your assignment from yesterday, I said, don't, don't worry about 21. And the reason is 21 has an equation with different bases. And you're not expected to do that. I used to teach it just for my calculus students, and I thought it, it's maybe just confusing other people. So when you take a look at the review package I've given you, Oh, no, that's actually in your, ha in your unit, isn't it? If you ever encounter something that I've given you that has an equation with different bases, uh, and this is in section G of the extra, extra practice on your handout, which is on page 36. So number one, you do, you're not expected to know how to do that. Uh, number three, you're not, a, well, no. Yeah, number three, you're not expected to know how to do. So anything that has an equation with multiple logarithms and different bases, 